Hey, folks, welcome, welcome. Hey, let's uh, let's first do the uh, perfunctory uh, checks and make sure that you can see and hear me all right. So I'm going to type in here, can you, maybe I'll spell it properly. Just to make sure, of course, every time it's worked, but it's going to be the one time I don't ask where it doesn't work and I go on for half an hour. So let's make sure you can see and hear me all right. Somebody chime in and say, yep, all right, Brock says we are good to go. Okay, uh, we only have a few folks with us to start out here, but I'm sure they'll be joining along as we move forward. And of course, this is always recorded and, and posted to YouTube, so you can always uh, um, get access to it from there. Hey, so everyone, good news. All those first few weeks we did with two modules in one week, oh, that's over. From here on out, one module a week. Now, there'll be some additional assignments that we plug in here and there. You have a paper to write. We're going to prepare for a final. This is all toward the end of the semester. The paper that you're going to write, the signature assignment, the my Renaissance paper, um, where that's going to be in stages. You're going to do a rough draft and then a, you know, a an outline, then a rough draft, then a final draft. But that doesn't start for a week or two. So we're not going to worry about it. Point is, while we are going to uh, switch from doing two modules a week to just one, uh, things will settle down a little bit, but there will be more things on the horizon. So don't get too lackadaisical. All right. So let's go ahead and start. Um, we've got something interesting. We are talking this week about the foundations of capitalism. Now, we have, in fact, been kind of discussing and exploring the various aspects of capitalism up until now. And uh, hey, Waleed, fantastic. Um, but uh, now is when we really get to put it all together and talk about capitalism as an economic system rather than just the pieces of capitalism. Uh, so we're going to do that in a few ways. We're going to talk about Wealth of Nations by um, Adam Smith. Wealth of Nations is like the definitive work on capitalism. Um, and, uh, and as we do that, we're also going to talk about iPencil. Uh, we're going to actually weave iPencil into Wealth of Nations because Wealth uh, iPencil just does a phenomenal job of expressing a certain concept that we're going to explore today. And then we are going to uh, wrap up by talking about the American economic system by David Porter. Here's the thing. We're going to talk about capitalism in its purest sense. However, capitalism does not exist in its purest sense. Um, doesn't, doesn't exist at all. America practices, hey, Nawal, fantastic. America practices a very unique type of capitalism, and we're going to explore what that is and, more importantly, why that is. Okay, so, yeah, there's lots of aspects of, of American capitalism that feel more socialist and more progressive. Why is that? We're going to explore that. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Let's jump into Wealth of Nations. Okay, now we've been exploring, and we're going to now add the fifth element of, of capitalism. So the first one that we talked about was the profit motive. And you'll remember the profit motive is this intrinsic sense we have that we need to always push forward. We need more. It's never enough. The profit motive tells us it's never enough. So you'll remember that I said, hey, Ahmad, fantastic. Welcome. 
I, I said with, when it comes to how much you earn in your life, right now, I promise you, you're sitting down in your room. Well, maybe there's somebody who's unique, but most of us are sitting down and you are not earning as much as you would like. Ergo, you're in school, right? Because you want a better job, you want better opportunities, things like that. But here's the thing. No matter how much you make, it will never be enough. It, you will always live beyond your means. And you will always be trying to find ways to get more money, more time, more resources, more energy, more whatever. Because everything is finite and we don't like finite. We always want more. That's the profit motive. Okay, you remember that? Now, the next one we talked about was private wealth or capital. Remember, we started to rope off lands, right? We enclosed land and said, uh, this is my land. And land that was before the sort of abstract, you know, just this physical thing that you just existed on, we embraced abstract land and said, actually, this is a wealth building resource. Furthermore, we allowed people to accumulate lots of capital, lots of wealth. And this was, remember, with our Protestant work ethic, right? The Protestant work ethic, if you'll remember, says, hey, listen, here, this is what you need to do. You're going to work your butt off because your job is your calling. So you better work your butt off, which means you're going to earn money. All right. Because if you work your butt off, you're going to earn money. But you're not allowed to spend that money on frivolous luxuries. You know, no bling. So if you're going to work your butt off because it's your calling, you're going to earn money, but you're not allowed to spend it on bling. What are you going to do with it? You're going to invest it. And wealth begets wealth. You got to make, you got to have, you know, takes money to make money. Wealth begets wealth. And it creates this wealth building engine because we have private capital being pumped, private wealth being pumped into the system so that people can make more money to invest more money, to make more money, to invest more money. Okay. You remember all that. Okay. So then that took us to free markets. And free markets say, listen, you can do whatever you want. You can do whatever. You don't have to be a shipbuilder because your name is shipbuilder, Schiffbauer in German. Um, you don't have to be, you know, forced into labor, indentured servitude and caste systems and slavery. That's out. You can do whatever you want and whatever the market will bear. And furthermore, you can charge whatever the market will bear. You can produce and so on and so forth. So the idea is, listen, if you want to be successful, all you have to do is look out there and see where is there a need. And you provide that need at a price that people are willing to pay and you can do so freely. But here's the thing. So can everybody else, right? They can go off and do this stuff freely which means there's competition. Well, is competition good? Oh, hell yeah, according to free markets. Because, because we're competitive, you have to practice more innovation. You have to offer more features. You have to offer better quality. And you have to provide your service or product at a lower cost because somebody else is going to do all those things if you don't. Somebody else is going to innovate and offer more features and better quality at a lower cost. And if you don't do those things, somebody else will and they will take your business. Well, we all have to do this in order to be competitive. And so free markets allow all this um, quality, all, the, all these benefits. Okay, that was free markets. And then we talked about laissez-faire. Laissez-faire was hands-off, no regulation. 
The economy is a natural ecosystem, dude. Come on, man. It's all natural. Okay. It's a natural ecosystem. And so the more you try to control it, the more you try to manipulate it, the more it's going to bite you in the butt. So just let it go, man. The market will naturally go where there is a need. All right. And the more you try to control it, the more you're going to mess it up. All right. So this was the no regulation. Um, Brock just asked, what would the difference be between free markets and laissez-faire? Very good question. So free markets, these are all interconnected. So that's a really good call out, first of all. There are five principles. We're about to see the fifth, but they're all interconnected. In order to have absolute free markets, you need to have laissez-faire, all right? You need to just let it go where it will go. So that is a part and parcel, uh, you know, arrangement. Now, of course, today, and we're going to talk about this in depth, Brock, um, we don't have laissez-faire and we don't have free markets. Well, why don't we and where are the lines, right? But in order to have an absolute free market, you need laissez-faire. Very good question. So, yeah, it's it's really hard to bifurcate the two. All right, that brings us to our fifth element, guys. The invisible hand. Now, invisible hand is one of those things that you've probably heard it before, but you would probably have a hard time defining it. Now, maybe some of you have already taken an economics class, and so you can go, oh, 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 teacher, I know what invisible hand is, and that's great. But I have to admit, before I went into college, I had no idea what it was, all right? So that's what we're going to talk about in some depth today, invisible hand, because this is an idea that um, Adam Smith came up with. So what we're going to do is we're going to read through some Adam Smith. In each case, I'm going to read the text and then I'm going to translate it for you because, yeah, it's funky stuff, right? OK, so invisible hand. As every individual, therefore, endeavors as much as he can both to employ his capital in the support of domestic industry and so to direct that industry that is to produce maybe of the greatest value, every individual necessarily labors to render the annual revenue of the society great as he can. The hell? What? This is what it means. Translation. As you work your ass off and invest your time, money, and energy to better your circumstance, your lot, you're going to help society. Okay? That's what he means. So, um, employ his capital in support of domestic industry means the more you work in support of your own home, your own family, your own need. That's what he means by domestic industry. Um you know, necessarily labors to render the annual revenue of society as great as he can, meaning you're going to help society. It's an inevitable side effect. All right, well, let's explore this a little further. Reading on with Smith. He generally, indeed, never, neither intends to promote the public interest, nor, um, nor knows how much he is promoting it. By preferring the support of domestic to the foreign industry, he intends only his own security. And by directing that industry in such a manner as to produce may be the greatest value, he intends only his own gain. And he is in, and he is in this, as much as other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote the end, which was no part of his intention. The heck? Translation. In fact, it is, no, it is in no way his intention to help society. He is just in it for himself, regardless 
help society he does, even though it was not his intention. Okay, let me give you a real world example of this, because we all do this. So years ago, I was working at Intel Corporation and I decided I wanted to move to academia. I wanted to be a college professor. Um, now, it's because I felt it was a better fit. I really enjoy teaching. I felt it was a better lifestyle, gave me more of the flexibility. I love this stuff. I hope you sense my passion for it and so forth. Um, hopefully, this is still coming through. I just got a notice saying that there's some streaming issues. But I wanted to become an instructor. Um, and so I went through all the process and now I'm an instructor. Now, here's the thing. Hopefully, I'm going to assume it for a moment, but hopefully you benefit from my decision to become an instructor. Hopefully you feel like Lon is a good instructor. He really cares about the material. He cares about my success. He, you know, invests in being in making sure that he delivers it well. Well, here's the thing. It's not like I made the decision to become an a instructor because I thought, you know what, there are college students out there that really need my help. No, I did it for selfish reasons. In the same way, when you decided to go to college, you're doing it for you. You, you're doing it for you. You selfish SOP. No, you're doing it all for yourself. You did not make the decision to go to college thinking, you know what, I bet there's an instructor out there who would really like to have people in his class. And so I'm going to go ahead and go to college just so I can get into Lon's class so that he can really enjoy teaching. No. So the whole idea of the invisible hand is that in as we go about trying to do what we want for ourselves, we inevitably help society. Okay, last reading from good old Smith here. Nor is it always the worst for society that it was in no way part of it. By pursuing his own interest, he frequently promotes that of the society more effectually than he does, than he really intends to promote it. And it goes on. Here's the idea. In fact, society is not worse off just because he did not intend to help society. The invi invisible hand is smarter than designed public policy or intent. Okay, so right now, at this moment, I am helping the employment of some people at Comcast because I'm using the Internet. I'm not using the Internet because I want to help them have a job. I'm using it because I want to talk with you, right? Um, when I bought this microphone, I employed a bunch of people. I didn't buy the microphone because I wanted to help them keep their job. I wanted the microphone because it's a darn good microphone, okay? Now, we don't need society and government and so forth to tell us where to buy and what to spend and who to promote. The invisible hand will take care of it all itself. So with that in mind, here's in other words, when we pursue our own economic self-interest, we inevitably um, benefit others, even if this was in no way our intent. OK, that's the invisible hand. It sounds awful, doesn't it? But the logic works. So with that in mind, let's talk through iPencil. Now, I strongly recommend, and, and I'm going to make this presentation available um, uh, so that you can pull up this video. This is actually a really cool video that talks about iPencil. Um, and I'm, I can't pull it up here, but I'll get you the link. Here's the idea of iPencil. <clears throat> no one person can make a pencil. No one person can make a pencil. It takes an entire economy to make a simple pencil. 
So just to look at one ingredient, let's say the wood. Okay, so what does it take to get the wood? Well, first, you got to cut down a tree. All right, well, that takes a lumberjack. Well, what does the lumberjack need to cut down a tree? Well, he or she needs a saw. Let's just say he for the sake of this discussion. Um, so he needs a saw. Well, where does he get the saw? Well, somebody produces that saw. Somebody makes a saw. All right, well, how do you make a saw? Well, you need somebody to design the saw. So there's this engineer, and she's out there designing the saw. And then, of course, you need somebody to manufacture the saw. Well, what do you manufacture it with? Well, you manufacture it with metal. Well, where do you get the metal? Well, you need to go to a mining group, and these guys and gals, they mine the material out of the mountain, and then they refine it. Well, all these people who are doing this stuff, well, they need food. So the farmer makes food that, that can be fed, but it has to be prepared. So you need cooks to prepare the food and so forth. And then, of course, all this stuff needs to be shipped all over the place. You know, the ore and the metal and the food and the saws and, and the wood. So that's going to take roads. So you need somebody to build the roads. It's going to take trucks. It's going to take fuel. So you got to have gasoline. Well, that means you got to go off. So here's the point. Just to get the wood takes lumberjacks, farmers, cooks, miners, designers, engineers, um, you name it. Okay. And that's just the wood. There's the rubber eraser, there's the metal ferrule here, there's the lead in there. And this is all global, all global. Now, there's no central body, no central brain to orchestrate all this. All of this orchestrates naturally, as though led by an invisible hand, okay? And it's not just pencils, anything. You look around. Look around you right now. What are you wearing? What are you sitting on? What are you... Everything it takes an entire army to produce. And yet there's no central intelligence that's orchestrating this army of people to produce this stuff. It all just kind of happens organically and to the most efficient state possible is the theory. Hold on to that. That's the invisible hand. So I recommend you you watch iPencil. You can also do the reading. It's a short reading, um, but the, the, the video does a tremendous job in explaining it. Okay, so one thing I like to point out, you know, here's the thing I just kind of point out here is that everything supports everything. Right now, I am making pencils. Somehow or another, the work I am doing at this very moment is helping to make pencils. Um, everything's connected. And I like to talk about the Oracle of Bacon, the six degrees of separation. Well, the fact is, the, the idea, the theory here is that everybody is connected to everybody on the earth through six degrees of separation or less. Um, Google this sometime and you'll see what I'm talking about. But that's kind of the invisible hand. Everything supports everything, you know, naturally, organically. Okay, so this is what we're going to try. I've never done this before over live stream. Um, I normally just do this in the in-class lectures. But I love doing it so much that I'm going to try to do it in live stream because it's really awesome. I have here a cartoon from like the 1940s. Yeah, a cartoon from the 1940s. It's basically some propaganda um, talking about um, American industry and capitalism and the profit motive. Um, what's really interesting is as we watch this cartoon, we will be able to see each and every one of these aspects discussed 
very specifically, right? And, um, and we're going to see how it works, but we're also going to point out some issues, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play this cartoon and I will pause it many, many times to kind of point something out, okay? Um, I'm hoping it doesn't screw up our lag, but we'll find out. Do me a favor right now and just kind of chime in to say, yep, I'm here and you know everything is working. And then each time I pause it, we'll see how much lag there is. So do me a quick favor. Let me know, say, yep, I'm here. Just so I know that we're all on the same page and then we're gonna go ahead and start this and see how it works. I know you're multitasking. It's normal. I go, totally get it. That's why I want to kind of make sure we're, we're set. Okay, Brock is with us. So we, we know that our sync is here and so forth. Good deal. Okay, so let's give this a try. All right, Mitch, fantastic. We'll come on over here. We'll pause it because I'm going to set us up right here. So... Um, like I say, I'm going to pause it several times and point out some things, and then we'll see if this screws up, like the frame count and so forth. All right. Our story begins, he is headed for the old fishing hole. Too bad. Freddie had helped his mother make soft soap to sell to their friends and neighbors. Shucks, if I didn't have to work, think of all the fun I could be having. Gee. Okay, so let's pause here for a second. First of all, can you hear the video okay? Can you hear, is that coming through all right? So we're gonna ask. Can you hear the video? Great, thank you, Brock. All right, yes, Noel, Mariana, Mitch, great, 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 great. Okay, here's the deal. So Freddie, he's this kid, right? He wants to go fishing, but he can't go fishing because he's got this lame ass chore that he has to do. He needs to make soap for his mother. And he's sitting here thinking, oh my gosh, think of all the fun I could be having if I didn't have to make this soap. Okay. Now, I want you to remember he wants to go fishing. He wants to go fishing. He wants to get out and have fun. All right. This will come back for us. But he can't. He has to make soap. So let's see what happens. Freddy tries to figure out an easier and quicker way to make soap. He goes to work to make his dreams of fun come true. To make his dreams of fun come true. After years of working night and day, Freddy's experiments bring success. Soap in cakes. Okay, so here's the thing. Because he wants more free time, more leisure, innovation comes into play. His imagination kicks in and he starts to think of, well, how can I actually make this soap faster and easier so I can have more free time, okay? So the profit motive is already kicking in, although for him at this stage, profit is free time. He wants free time, so he's willing to work to get it, right? Okay, so let's see what happens with Freddy. 
Pretty soon, word gets around to the housewives who want shorter, easier wash days and cleaner clothes. Freddy's soap is just what they need. Now, mind you, watch this. The housewives want shorter, easier wash days and cleaner soap and cleaner clothes. And Freddy's soap is just the ticket, right? They're not running into Freddy's shop because they like Freddy. They want what is in their best interest. So Freddy is working in his best interest. He's not making soap because he loves soap. He wants more free time. The women, they don't want his soap because they love Freddy. They want cleaner clothes and easier wash days. So everybody is acting in their own economic self-interest. Okay? his profits in larger quarters and new equipment to make enough soap to satisfy the demand. He invests his profits. Okay, now, whether you realize it or not, there was a shift that just happened there when all the ma mon money came, you know, flowing in. His profit motive shifted from, I want to go fishing, to, oh, well, this money thing is kind of cool. And so he invests his profits. So we are seeing um, profit motive. And we are now seeing investment of private capital wealth, right? And we're starting to see some free market stuff, you know, coming on. But, you know, you see all these elements coming together. Finally, his dreams come true. Time off for fun on Saturday. Hey, Freddy, a guy can fish anytime. A 23 skidoo. Goodbye, Freddy. Hopelessly in love, he wants to make good in a big way. So back to work. Okay, I love this. Check it out. By the way, spoiler alert, this poor schmuck never goes fishing. Okay, so he's ready to go fishing. He's earned enough money. He wants to go off and fish. But now the locus of his motivation, what he wants has changed. He wants to make good in a big way. So back to work. His profit motive has shifted shifted yet again. Before he wanted more leisure time, then he wanted more money. Now he wants, you know, whatever that was. Okay? So, what does he do? As the company grows, it brings the railroad and other businesses to town. Increased property taxes from the thriving community help to build better schools, streets, parks, libraries, playgrounds, and waterworks. This is classic invisible hand, okay? So, f remember, Freddy was originally just in it for free time. Then he's in it for the money. And then he's in it to get lucky, all right? It's always self-interest. But because he's successful and because it's growing, support services start to come into play. I'll give you an example. Go out to Point of the Mountain, Thanksgiving Point, you know, Tech Corridor, whatever you want to call it now. It is exploding out there because a few tech companies come in and set up shop. And before you know it, all kinds of support industry. And they're having to rebuild the roads out there. They are redoing the sewage. They're redoing power. They're redoing all kinds of things simply because some companies started to set up shop out there and be successful. This is invisible hand at, at work. Taxes even help to provide more and better governmental services, such as police protection. Now I want to point something out here. 
And this helps to explain a lot of kind of the conservative mindset when it comes to politics. Notice they said that the increased commerce allows the, allows the government to collect taxes. And with those taxes, they are able to provide public services. Okay, now that makes sense, right? As commerce and, and, and the economy grows, the tax base grows, which means we can use those taxes to provide more services. But now here's the thing. With that setup, and I'm not arguing with the setup, but it's a mindset I want you to kind of understand. With that setup, it means that business is the driver of public services provided by the government. Okay? And so when the conservative side of the aisle in politics says it's all about, you know, increase business, help out the businesses, help the economy, and on all this stuff, it's because they believe that with increased business success, increase in taxes comes about, not even increasing taxes, but there's just more commerce going on, which means providing better government services. You cannot provide government services without money. And the only way you can get that money is through taxes that come about from a strong economy. So this is why the conservatives are often kind of accused of taking care of big business. The conservatives will say, well, yeah, we're taking care of big business because big business is and small business, you know, the, the business person. That's what allows us to provide these these government services. Notice, though, the government services, there's some corruption there. He's eating the apple. Just saying. Before long, Freddie becomes a successful businessman. Doesn't he look like a happy son of a gun? He's a successful businessman. I'm going to actually talk about this toward the end of the semester, because if you're not careful, the economy will eat you alive. And look at this. They're doing it all tongue in cheek like it's a joke. It's no joke. This is real. All right. It's funny because it's real. A successful businessman. The guy's going to die by the time he's 50. And incidentally, a successful husband and father. Fudzi's expanding company creates all kinds of jobs that never existed before. Okay, this is more of the invisible hand. His expanding company creates jobs. It wasn't his intent to create jobs. He's got the family now. He's all good. He just needs the employees, right? And it's not like the employees are working for Fudzi because they love Fudzi. They just need the job. To increase production and sales, Fudzi builds up a strong labor management team. Each year, he invests a portion of his profit in research to develop better soap that can be made to sell at lower prices. Research, better soap to be sold at lower prices. That's because there's competition out there. This is a free market. And if he doesn't stay on his game, he's going to lose market share. The Fudsey Company continues to grow with the years because it makes a good soap, which in competition with others sells at a fair price. Competition forces each manufacturer to improve his product, to sell it for less, and to give the consumer more for a dollar than his competitor. Free market. Get more for, for less, get more bang for their buck. That's all free market. And Fudzi is hard to beat. Finally, he gets so many orders, he realizes that one factory simply can't meet the demand. His profit motive starts sparking to figure out a way to increase production. See, the, look at this guy. He's like, has this huge building corner off his massive window. Isn't it enough? I mean... How much is enough? It's never enough. 
Even now, his profit motive is saying, I can get more, I can get more. His profit motive starts sparking to figure out a way to increase production. He forms a corporation and issues stock to raise money to build factories from coast to coast. Now we're going to see investment of capital. We're going to see people investing their funds in his business, not because they love their business, but because they want to return on that investment. Here is the investment of capital that we learned out from the Puritan work ethic. But these employees have faith in his management and back him with their savings. Banks loan depositors money to help finance the expansion program. Insurance companies loan the funds of their policyholders to help build the factory. Stock exchanges act as a clearinghouse for people from all walks of life to buy security. Before long, everybody gets plenty of soap. At last, Fudsey's success is complete. Soap City. What we are about to now see is the principle of laissez-faire. So watch out for this. The profit motive, which drove Fudsey to accomplish so much, may bring out the evil as well as the good. Hello? Fudsey, old boy, I've got a great idea. Between us, we control 70% of the country's soap sales. Yeah, but quiet. Let's see what's cooking. I smell trouble. Let's raise and fix our prices. Controlling 70% of the market way, we'll clean up. Terrific. We'll make millions. Millions to go. Quiet. Okay, Sam. It's a deal. You'll be sorry. <laughs> Fudzy and Sam. Okay, just so you're clear on what they're going to do. So these two competitors, they're, they've agreed to not compete anymore. Together, they control 70% of the market. So what they're going to do is they are both going to raise their prices and just stick with the same price. And that way they're going to make more money because they own, they control 70% of the market. Let's see what happens. Sudso raise and fix prices, but the result is not what they expect. A competitor comes along with a good bar of soap that sells at a lower price. Since shoppers always seek maximum value, only the lower priced soap sells. While Fudsey and Sam Sudso's profits turn into losses. 99 times out of 100, competition works. Okay, I want you to hear this again. They're going to say 99 times out of 100, competition works. But watch this. Watch what they claim. Losses. 99 times out of 100, competition works. When it doesn't, the government steps in to prevent monopolistic attempts. Okay, watch what they just said. They said, listen, 99 times out of 100, competition works. In other words, that free market works. Laissez-faire, leave it alone. It'll work fine. In the 1% of times that it doesn't work, government can step in and say, hey, dudes, that's not cool and so forth. So what this cartoon is claiming is laissez-faire. If you just let the system work the way it works in its natural behavior, everything will take care of itself. You don't need governmental controls. And in those very, very, very few cases where you need governmental controls, fine, they'll step in and do something or another. But for the most part, you don't need it. Now, watch what happens next. That was a tough break. Now the next time... Check this out. What this is claiming is that you don't need laws, rules, and regulations about ethical behavior. If you just allow the system to work the way it does, free market laissez-faire, then you, you know, people will eventually make the ethical decision. Not because they are ethical people, but because the ethical approach is the one that makes the most money. Okay, so as it shows here, it's not that Fudzi all of a sudden found God or anything. It's just he doesn't want to get spanked by the market again. And so he's going to make ethical, good decisions going forward, 
because of the profit motive. Interesting premise, okay? Only a business operating at a steady profit can give its workers security and employee benefits. Operating at a profit, a business can provide the employee with comfortable, colorful working conditions. Okay, I want you to pay some attention here. Only a company working at a profit can provide these things. So here's my point. This cartoon is about to assert that all these things should come from businesses. Remember, I said that taxes come from businesses and taxes provide public services. Well, watch all the things that they say you need business to do for you. High wages and steady employment. Okay, I can buy that. High wages and steady employment. All right. First aid and health protection. Mm -hmm. First aid and health protection. Okay, with our system, with the exception of if you're a veteran or if you're um, um, elderly or disabled, actually, there's a lot of people who get Medicaid. Um, in our medical system, it's the employer who provides health protection, not the government, you know, not even the private market. It's the employer. Well, this puts a lot of power in the hands of employers. Let's see what else our system relies on employers to provide. Accident and life insurance. All right, life insurance and so forth. Time off for vacation. The employee working for a profitable business can maintain a savings account. Maintain a savings account for retirement, okay? In our current economic system, maybe you have a 401k through your employer where you save some money and the employer maybe, you know, throws in some money. Now, we have Social Security as a social net, a safety net, but we really just perceive that as a safety net, right? The idea is that it's really up to you to save for your retirement. Own his own home and have plenty of leisure to enjoy the peace and quiet of family life. When investors receive fair dividends, they are eager to supply industry with a steady flow of capital to create new tools and plants, which in turn create new jobs. With business prosperous and employment high, the farmer has a ready and profitable market for the with with business high, the farmer has a ready and profitable market. Invisible hand. All those people need to eat. For the sale of his produce. When businesses all over the country operate at a steady profit, our economic health is tops. Okay. So there, there you are. It goes off and does a few more things, but it gets kind of weird and silly. Yeah, like a weird and silly. What do you mean? It's been weird and silly from the beginning. So let's come back here. Um, so first of all, um, let me ask, did that work? Did it, did, were you able to watch and hear the movie and, um, and it didn't mess with, with the streaming and with, um, um, screen, what am I trying to say? Um, was it skipping around? Was it really bad video? Could you understand it? So let me ask, um, Did that work from a tech perspective? Did that work from a tech perspective? Because if it did, I'll, I'll do it again in the future. All right, worked fine, good, good. That's what I was hoping. I was really hoping because, uh, good, Mitch, it didn't skip around. Awesome, awesome. I'm really glad to hear that because I love that. You know, here's a cartoon made for propaganda, you know, made, you know, easily 70, 80 years ago. No kidding. 
and uh, and we can see all the pieces of of the profit motive included. And of course, this is the extreme, right? Because they're really trying to get you to buy into it. Well, that is that is it for the for um, wealth of nations and eye pencil. Here's a quote from Henry Rollins. Henry Rollins. It was the former lead singer of the hardcore punk band um, Black Flag. But he's like a huge, you know, capitalist success, right? Henry Rollins is really quite amazing. He says, I love capitalism. It rewards me for being brave. It awards me for being innovative and thinking out of the box. And trust me, Henry Rollins thinks out of the box. Um he believes strongly that he's not that smart, that he's not that privileged. And if you look at his background, he's really not. Um, he believes that capitalism really, you know, makes opportunity for somebody like him. Now, he works his ass off. Um, and, you know, even though he doesn't have a privileged background, he's still a white male and not too bad looking and got in with a, a band. So he became sort of famous. So that has all kinds of privilege with it. But um, if you look at his life story, it wasn't just handed to him. So he believes in capitalism. All right. OK, so what I want to do now is uh, um, we are going to do a stretch break. And to do a stretch break, I'm going to try something here because we've been sitting around. Oh, hold up. Hold on. I went to the wrong one. Here it is. Okay. And we come over to the... Start. Yeah, it's upside down. Okay, there I am. I'm going to get up and stretch, but to do that, I'm going to show you something just for the fun bit. So, yeah, there's the puppy. This is just so I can get up and move around. And you can get up and move around, too. You don't have to sit around and watch this. All right, this is just me goofing off. Um, I'm going to show you a project we're working on. My wife and I, we've got in a whole bunch of uh, movie posters that we are going to hang up on the wall here. Here's some stuff we've already put up. Because this is the family room. Oh, I lost you. This is the family room. And uh, yeah, I lost you. Oh, I guess it was still going. That's the family room where we watch the TV, we watch our pictures, our stories, and we're into movies. We're really into movies. So we're putting up a whole bunch of movie posters and so forth just to kind of have fun with it. I'm going to go ahead and close this so we don't get puppy. This, by the way, is my studio. So when you watch the Nutshell Brainery videos, this is the background, right? And then, of course, there's all kinds of lighting you have to do. And I put up these um, curtains and so forth to help with the sound because it's hard to get really good sound when you're, when you're shooting video. Okay, enough of that. All righty. I think I can turn this off. All right, there we go. Okay. I'll give you another couple minutes. Get up, stretch, move around. And then we'll move on to the last part, which is the American economic system. Okay. Are you back and ready? Uh, ready to 
to start. Let's get a few folks chiming in saying, yep, yeah, back, ready to start, all that good stuff. All right, Brock, ready to go. Let's get a couple more folks saying, yep, ready. Let me know when you're ready to start. We got a A-OK -okay from Brock. All right, Mariana, Noel, Noel, there we go. Fantastic. Let me see one or two more. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get going then. Okay, so last part. Um, let's do this. The American economic system. All right, so here's the thing. We just explored pure capitalism, right? Capitalism unfettered by, by regulation, as close to laissez-faire as you can get. And, um, you, know, you know, what you know, people all over the world dream about and so forth. Well, we don't practice pure capitalism at all. OK, um, so uh, let's explore why. All right. It's, it's not just enough to understand where we practice some socialist aspects, but it's really a question of why. So first of all, let's do a quick question thing. Right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go to our question slide. I want you to give me some examples of where we do not practice capitalism, okay? Where we practice something closer to socialism, all right? So let me go ahead and put up the ask question slide and give me some examples of where we have some socialist practices. Okay, boy, I bet that got annoying. I realized that I did not turn off my desktop audio. So the music to that was probably like uber annoying. I'm really sorry. I mean, I know it's annoying music anyway, but yeah, you know, whatever. Um, but that was really bad. Okay, let's explore some of this, right? So Brock, we got food stamps. Yeah, okay, food stamps is a form of redistrib redistribution of wealth. You go ahead and tax one person so that you can give somebody else food stamps so that they can get food cheaper, which means the taxpayer, the people are subsidizing food for somebody with food stamps. OK, that is a socialist idea that we would subsidize somebody else's food. OK, um, Mariana, nature. I'd like tell me a little bit about what you mean by nature. OK, um, there's there's more to there, I'm sure. I don't want to try to guess what you're referring to. Um, come on, folks. There's lots of others out there. Um, food stamps. OK. Um, how about this? How much does your water cost? 
See, here's the thing. Water and electricity, the utilities, um, highly, highly, highly subsidized by the government. These are public works. The idea is everybody should have really cheap access to electricity, gas, and water. And you, in fact, if I were to ask you how much is a gallon of water from your tap, you'd have no idea. It's so cheap that you bathe in the crap and you don't even know how much you're paying for it. Okay, that's that's a form of, you know, socialism. Um, K through 12, your education from kindergarten to 12th grade, K through 12 was funded by the people. All right. Now, yeah, OK, there were some school fees that your parents had to pay for and you had to do some you know, fun drive so that you could buy uniform stuff for, you know, uh, the sports. But K through 12 is funded, right? Um, so then you've got, uh, okay, food stamps subsidizes food. Do you realize how much agriculture is subsidized? I mean, to an amazing degree, okay? I am not making this up. The cost of a loaf of bread today is more or less the cost of a loaf of bread 10 years ago, which was more or less the cost of a loaf of bread 20 years ago. Same for a gallon of milk. Well, now, how is it that no matter the weather, no matter how the crops are doing, a loaf of bread always costs a lo the same? I'll tell you how. We subsidize farmers. Um if they have a really, really rotten season and they make they, they grow very little, then the government will subsidize. That means that they have limited supply, which means they should be able to charge anything for this wheat. Right. If I normally have 100 bush bushels of wheat, but now I've only got 50, I can charge double for that wheat given supply and demand because there's so little wheat out there all the bakers are going to want it all. The government will step in and say, hey, dear farmer, we'll pay you the difference. We want you to sell your 100 bushel, your 50 bushels of wheat at the exact same price as if you had 100. We will subsidize the rest. We'll write a check to you. Well, what happens if they have a fantastic season and they make 200 bushels? The government will come in and say, listen, we need you to plow under all that wheat that you have not yet harvested. You see that beautiful wheat out there just waiting to be harvested? We need you to plow that under because if you put all that wheat out on the market, it will destroy the wheat market. OK, they do this with all kinds of food. Well, we're going to talk about why that is. OK. The list can go on and on and on and on. We have many areas in which we have very heavy controls on prices and production of, of goods and services. All right. Well, why is that? Well, this is what and this is I know it's lame. I took a picture of a book page. I'm putting it on here. It's all right. We'll work through this. OK. This is what David Potter believes are the guideposts that the U.S. uses in figuring out where to practice capitalism and where not to. OK. Um, the fact that the masters of capital have never been really in full control means that they have never been able to set the goals of the American economy. Instead, and this is the second major economic or whatever, the goals of the economy have been set by the dem democratic philosophy rather than the theories of capitalism. OK, here's the thing. Democratic philosophy, not the theories of capitalism. So let me just draw it in really stark juxtaposition. The theory of capitalism says, hey, survival of the fittest. You know, you don't cut it, you're out. Too bad. It's the natural system, whatever. Whereas the philosophy of the democratic system says mm, all are created equal. We need equal opportunity. 
Um, all, you know, everybody is equal in the eyes of God and, and so on and so forth. And we need to make sure that everybody has a voice in, sorry, in, in democratic philosophy. Well, if everyone has a voice and everybody is of equal importance, you are just as important as I in the economy, well, then you really can't have pure capitalism because the pure capitalist doesn't say, yeah, you're equal. Okay, let's read on. Historically, what have American people expected from their economy? They have not cared very much for maximum efficiency, which is what the theorists of free competition are constantly talking about. In fact, they have tolerated immense waste in the use of natural resources. They have not sought the elimination of inefficient or marginal producers, which again, which again is the most presumed merits of free competition, but have gone to the aid of marginal producers, especially in agriculture. In other words, pure capitalism would say, if you can't cut it, you're out of business. It's just the way it is. If you can't compete, you're out. Whereas America has said, you know, and we'll come to the aid of these com companies quite a bit. You know, we will give special tax breaks to small companies. We will uh, really help out farmers and ranchers and so forth. Um, when they come on hard times, we're not going to say, hey, you had three bad years in a row. Too bad. I guess you're not a farmer anymore. Right. No, we come to the aid of these companies. Um, why? Well, let's check this out. OK. If we look not to the theory, but to the experience, we may find the only economic policy that American people have always assisted on is and, and consistently applied is that the system should operate in such a way as to give the bulk of the population access to sources of wealth. Yes, American capitalism really believes in access to wealth, access to wealth, access to wealth. Okay. Now, the reason for this should be pretty clear. It is wealth that begets wealth. And Americans love the idea that this is the land of opportunity. This is the land of opportunity. Well, in order to exploit opportunity or chase after opportunity, you need access to wealth to do that. OK, so the system is really hardwired to making sure that people have access. So, you know, home loans, business loans, um, free education and um, roads, free roads. We don't go in for toll roads very much these days and low taxes. These are all aspects of access to wealth. OK. All right, let's keep going. So one of these goals is the maximum of opportunity for the individual. We love the idea that any individual can. I came to this. I came to this state with a dollar thirty seven in my pocket and the clothes on my back. And I am a self-made man and pull myself up on my boots. We love that crap. OK, we really enjoy it. We conveniently forget the invisible hand that tells us that we need an entire ecosystem to help us be a self-made man. There is no such thing as a self-made man. Uh, uh, Never happened. All right. Um. But we really enjoy the idea of people exploiting opportunity. So that's what we mean by the maximum, the maxim, the saying of opportunity for the individual arising from the strong American belief in the dignity and worth of man. So this whole thing that we're going on with like masks right now with COVID-19 happening. There's this big debate over whether masks infringe on my rights as an individual. Only Americans 
would come up with the idea that wearing a mask infringes on their rights as an individual. That is such an American ideal there. And so we have an economy that really, you know, hinges on that. The other is the goal of high and steady improving, uh, improving standard of living. We Americans really love, and I, I apologize, by the way, I need to call this out. I keep saying we Americans. Not everybody watching this is American. You've grown up in a different culture. Your economy was built on different fundamental principles. So I apologize for saying this thing of we Americans. What we're doing is we are looking at the American economic system. And so I'm saying we Americans in kind of the aggregate of what Potter's talking about. But we have not all grown up in these systems. Me, I spent a lot of time in Europe as a kid. We didn't have these systems in Europe. Okay, I continue. Americans really love the idea of ever increasing standard of living, that each generation will do better than the previous. And in order to have this, we need to have a system that is geared toward standard of living. Well, standard of living is for everybody. A purely capitalist system may not look after the standard of living of everyone. Okay, uh, standard of living arising from the fact that American society began its major growth at the um, moment in history when, for the first time since the beginning of the world, the productive system was capable of yielding a steady increase of surplus above the bare necessities. Americans, by and large, are not happy if they simply have the bare necessities. We tend, we Americans, tend to measure success and prosperity by how much surplus we have. You, you want to know what I mean? How many pairs of shoes do you own? If you own more than one pair of shoes, you have surplus. If you own five or six pairs of shoes, you're getting into real surplus. If you own more than 10 pairs of shoes, you are now in first world luxury. And I could do the same thing with jack jackets and hats and who knows what. Okay. All right. So let me give you an example of how this works. Have you ever heard, you know, you know, why do childless homeowners pay school tax? We don't use the school system, so shouldn't we pay less or nothing at all? And this is a real question offered up. It's, it's a question that comes up a lot. Well, yes, in a purely, purely capitalist system, a homeowner, I have this home here, shouldn't pay into a school system if they don't have kids. It's not a service I require, so it's fine. But that is the most insane proposition ever, ever, all right? We all benefit from an educated citizenry. We all benefit from an educated citizenry. We want a citizenry who knows how to look at issues, you know, with critical thinking, who knows how to vote, who knows how to practice, you know, civil obedience and civil disobedience. We want a citizenry who knows how to be productive in society and make money and pay taxes. If you have an uneducated citizenry wandering around, you tell me what happens to your property taxes or your property value. It plummets. OK, well, this is an example, though, of where we have said it is in the best interest of the whole for those who own land, which is a wealth building asset, to redistribute their wealth to the kids so they can get an education. Well, this all plays into maximum opportunity for the individual. In order for that K through 12 or a Salt Lake Community College student 
who has 60%, 60 percent, six zero, 60 percent of your tuition is subsidized by the state. In order for you to go off and become a productive, economic productive, right? You're all awesome. But to be economically productive, it is in our best interest to pay for that. Maximum opportunity for the individual and increased standard of living. So that is David Potter's premise there. Okay, now I'm going to just read this one thing. You'll have a question in the um, exam, discussion, whatever, that talks about the role of advertising. I'm going to read this one highlighted area, but we're not going to go deep into it because the following readings that we come come up here in a week or so really go deep into this in a really awesome way. So I don't want to mess with it right now. But here's remember where I said, listen, we have all this surplus now and you can have 10 pairs of shoes and 18 hats and and 14 jackets. Right. Well, as he says here. Perhaps the most convincing proof of the extent to which the American standard has soared above the physical necessities is not statistical at all, but lies in the fact that Americans no longer buy most of their purchases in response to actual physical need. Need has been transcended as an economic stimulus and goods are bought for the comfort, convenience, recreation, style, and prestige. So what does that mean? Well, it means, listen, most of what you buy, it's because it's really awesome. All right, what's something I bought recently? I don't know. Oh, this microphone. It's a really awesome microphone, right? Did I need it? No, this cam here right here has a microphone built into it, but it sucks. And I wanted better. And I actually have this microphone. I have a shotgun microphone up there. My wife wants me to get a lav mic. She thinks that would work better. This is all out of comfort, convenience, recreation, style, and prestige. It's not that if I don't buy this microphone, I will die. No, it has been a long time. I'm not saying never. I'm not saying never. But it has been a long time since you have purchased something because you had absolute necessity such that your life was hinging upon it. OK, most of the stuff we buy in this country is because we want it. Style, prestige, comfort, convenience, things like that. Like I say, we're going to talk a lot more about that in future readings, but I just wanted to kind of toss that out there. So in closing, here's our closing um, quote from Martin Luther King Jr. Capitalism does not permit an even flow of economic resources. With this system, a small privileged few are rich beyond conscience, and almost all the others are doomed to be poor at some level. That's the way the system works. And since we know that the system will not change the rules, we are going to have to change the system. And this is the core of what really becomes a lot of conflict or creates conflict between liberals, conservatives, progressives, conservatives, what have you, is the degree to which it should be laissez faire. Because what Martin Luther King is talking about here is change the system that is the opposite of laissez faire. We got to change the system. Whereas on the conservative side, it's like, no, 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 it's a natural system. Just let it work. We can, you know, regulate a few things, but let the system work. The tide raises all ships, is the theory. Martin Luther King takes issue with that. Okay. And folks, that's it. Oh, gosh, it was still an hour and 20 minutes. I apologize, even though it was just one module there. But um, great work. Um, that's it. I'm going to stick around in case you have any questions. But let me just ask this. Do you feel like you have everything you need to be successful this week? If there's anything you're missing, anything you're unsure about, let me know. But if you feel like you have everything you need to be successful this week, give me a yeppers and we're good.
And until then, we'll uh, we'll see you next week. So go ahead and type in there. I'll uh, I'll let you all go, and um, we'll see you in a week. Have a good one.